June 25, 2015, was the 65th anniversary of the outbreak of the Korean War. General Pek son who fought as division commander when the Korean War broke out in 1950, is a famous hero of the war. He became the first commander of the Korean Army with a string of achievements, such as leading the first division to enter the walls of Pyongyang. 65 years since the tragedy that sealed the division of the two Koreas, General Peck remembers the fierce battles like they took place yesterday. The surprise attack by North Korea resulted in the fall of Seoul in just three days. The United Nations Security Council was called for an emergency meeting to respond to the first Cold War conflict, taking place just five years after the end of World War II. The Security Council defined the North's aggression as an act of invasion in the UN Charter and resolved to send military support to the Republic of Korea. It was the first police action by the United Nations Army since its establishment. The United Nations Charter was based on the concept of collective security system. North Korean act of aggression was countered with collective measure by the United Nations. Therefore, the United Nations sent uh, 16 members of the United Nations to fight against aggressor North Korea. On July 7, 1950, the United Nations Command was established with American General Douglas MacArthur as Commander-in-Chief. Sixteen nations including the U.S., U.K., and Canada sent combat forces, which totaled over 150,000 soldiers. The participation of the U.N. forces reversed the unilateral advance of the North Korean Army. The combined forces of the United Nations and the South Korean Army launched a full counterattack while defending the Nakdonggang River front. The Incheon landing of September 15th led to the successful reclaiming of Seoul on September 28th. <laughs> However, the tide turned once more when the People's Volunteer Army of China got involved. The United Nations Command and the South Korean Army had to retreat from North Korea, and fighting continued for three years until the ceasefire was signed on July 27, 1953. In the three years of war, 130,000 South Korean troops were killed, while 450,000 were injured. The United Nations forces also suffered 40,000 deaths and 100,000 injuries. Very recently, there was a satellite picture of the Korean Peninsula, and it was quite astonishing in a sense that the northern part, there's no light except for a very small flicker in Pyongyang. In the south, it's brilliant with light all over. Had it not been for the UN intervention, today we wouldn't be having this interview. Today, the entire Korean Peninsula might be in that darkness. Uh, but fortunately, because of the UN intervention and saving South Korea from the onslaught of the North Korean invasion, South Korea was able to prosper uh, to the point where we are at right now. In 2015, 65 years after the Korean War, South Korea is now dispatching peacekeeping forces to conflict areas as a member of the United Nations. It has gone from recipient of military support from the UN to a donor nation.
Major Che Pilyong is a soldier who served in Sudan from 2006 to 2008 as part of the UN peacekeeping mission to the region long suffering from civil war. My job was in Sudan uh, to observe uh, the observance of the, uh, the armistice agreement. We have also uh, an armistice agreement with the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. That is very meaningful to me because I could understand uh, how Korea was the meaning of armistice and how uh, precious and how valuable peace is. Korea sent its first peacekeeping force, the Sangnoksu Engineer Battalion, to Somalia in July 1993. Since then, it has been an active participant in UN peacekeeping operations, sending 12,500 men to 16 nations. Korean forces have won the hearts of the locals, earning nicknames such as King of the Multinational Forces and Gift from the Gods. Uh, local people, when they saw the uh, logo, a uh, UN logo, uh, UN uh, big mark and blue helmets and blue beret, uh, they were very happy to see us uh, and uh, welcome us uh, like uh, very precious guests. I really strongly felt that the, uh, they really uh, appreciated our uh, efforts and our contribution to the peace of Sudan. I think it's really, really precious memory for me more than anything. As of June 2015, the Korean army has 635 men dispatched to nine UN peacekeeping missions, ranking 36th in troops contribution. Korea's efforts have been recognized, with Koreans being appointed to high-ranking posts in UN peacekeeping operations. Commander Che Young Bom also served as leader of the United Nations Military Observer Group in India and Pakistan for two years, from 2012. As a commander in the Korean Army, he wanted to give back to the UN for the help it gave his country 65 years ago. So all the Korean people very much thank to the United Nations help saving our country from the North Korean aggression. So it's time to pay back for the international, you know, the peace and security. Korea was liberated from Japanese rule on August 15, 1945. On October 24th of the same year, the United Nations was established to work for the shared goal of world peace. 2015 is a special year for both Korea and the UN as the 70th anniversary of liberation and establishment, respectively. The Second World War was a devastating tragedy, which resulted in the greatest loss of lives in human history. Following its conclusion, the international community wanted to build a powerful international organization. The League of Nations was not functioning uh, in a way to maintain international law and order. Therefore, there was a strong need to create a new international institution that can transcend uh, the League of Nations. The world had experienced a tremendous tragedy, and there was a global consensus that something like this has to be prevented, uh, that there should be some sort of a world governance where peace will be secured and security will be maintained. In 1947, the United Nations General Assembly passed a resolution to install the United Nations Temporary Commission on Korea, or UNTCOK. This led to the establishment of the Government of the Republic of Korea through elections held on May 1948. Korea has a very special relationship with the United Nations, more than any other country in the world. When uh, Korea was established in 1948, United Nations General Assembly passed a resolution recognizing the Republic of Korea the only legitimate government in the Korean Peninsula. The third United Nations General Assembly was held in 1948. It was where the Republic of Korea was recognized by the international community as the only legitimate government in the Korean Peninsula. However, it would be a long and rocky path to its accession as an official member of the United Nations, a long-held goal even before the establishment of the government. 
North and South Korean government were competing each other for a sole legitimate government on the Korean Peninsula. There was a fierce diplomatic struggle between North and South Korea in the United Nations. However, in 1991, both North and South Korea agreed to join the United Nations as full members. And by doing that, they were able to get away from the protracted diplomatic battle uh, in the United Nations. On September 17, 1991, the Republic of Korea finally became an official member of the United Nations. This was achieved 40 years after its first attempt. Soon after its accession, South Korea began to contribute actively to the international community. In just five years after UN accession, South Korea became a non-permanent member of the Security Council, the most powerful decision-making body of the United Nations. It attained the presidency of the UN General Assembly in 2001. Former Prime Minister Han seung soo who was appointed President of the United Nations and accepted the Nobel Peace Prize on behalf of the United Nations, looks back on that historic moment. Of course, I was very much honored to be elected President of the 56th session of the United Nations General Assembly. But as you may recall, the day I was to be elected, September 11, 2001, was the day when the World Trade Center was struck by the terrorist attack. During my presidency, it was, in a sense, a series of crisis management of the United Nations. And I think our team, Korean team, played a very important role in stabilizing the situation and overcoming the crisis at the time. In 2006, Pan Ki-moon became the first Korean and the second Asian to be appointed as the Secretary General of the United Nations. Secretary General Pan was unanimously re-elected for a second term in 2011. Secretary General Pan Ki-moon um, and I worked uh, four times during our long public service together, and he's one of the most admirable officials that I have worked with. As the Secretary General, Mr. Pan Ki-moon has been playing a very, very important role in promoting world peace, uh, economic development, and uh, human rights. He has been traveling to every corner of the world, particularly to underprivileged developed countries in Africa and other parts of the world. And he has been doing a lot of good work for the people. Korea has been active in key bodies of the United Nations, the General Assembly, Security Council, and Secretariat. On top of that, it is active in 26 specialized organizations and agencies of the UN. Its financial contribution to the UN has also been increasing. As of 2014, South Korea was the 13th largest contributor to the United Nations budget. As you may remember, Korea was a very poor country. Until the 60s, Korea's per capita income was less than $100 US dollars. Now, our per capita income is almost 30 thousand dollars purchasing power parity index if you're according to the purchasing power parity index and uh, since 19, 2010 korea has become member of the development assistance committee of the oecd which means that korea ceased to become aid receiver but we began to provide aid to other country in april this year a devastating earthquake ravaged nepal as emergency aid from all over the world rushed to the region. The Korean Committee for UNICEF collected over 35 million US dollars of donations in just two months. But South Korea was a country in desperate need of UNICEF aid 65 years ago. When the Korean War broke out in 1950, UNICEF started an emergency relief program for the Korean children and women, which later became a full-scale uh, program of cooperation carried out with the government of the Republic of Korea. In the 1960s, UNICEF provided 63 million kilograms of powdered milk and 300,000 blankets 
and also other, many other relief supplies to children. I myself was a small boy uh, who directly received some of the UNICEF uh, emergency relief goods. However, Korea rapidly developed its economy and social welfare to become a partner of UNICEF just four decades after. In 1994, the Korean National Committee for UNICEF was established, transforming the Republic of Korea into a donor to the developing uh, countries. You know, Korea still uh, remains the first and the only such transformation case. Now the nation donates more than 87 million U.S. dollars a year, which come from the largest number of regular donors among all country committees of UNICEF. It ranks in the top 10 in donations to developing countries. This is how far the Korean Committee for UNICEF has come in 20 years since its establishment. We uh, Koreans are well aware of the incredible sufferings that so many children all over the world are experiencing in the civil wars and in general poverty since their plights powerfully remind us of the same of our children 60-some years ago. It is still in our vivid memory that thanks to UNICEF's um, assistances, our children were able to improve their health and uh, receive the education. Therefore, the Korean National Committee for UNICEF is now determined to renew or redouble its effort to protect, develop, and educate suffering children the world over. Following its unprecedented economic growth, South Korea became a member of the Development Assistance Committee in 2009. It is now seeking cooperation with the UN through the Korean model of development aid, which draws from its own experience as a success story in national economic development. The Semaul movement, which began in the 1970s, was the driving force enabling Korea to overcome post-war poverty, build the foundations for modernization, and making it the 13th largest economy in the world. Gyeongsangbukjo province is where the Semaul movement first began 45 years ago. Semaul movement, Silchon movement, and the time, the attitude, the thinking, the change in the movement. But this movement, in the world, was the UN and the help of the UN. Finally, the world's poverty is the goal of the UN. The goal of the UN is to make peace. Also, we, the Semaul movement, the world's movement, 어, 봉사의 그런 전선을 구축해서 대한민국과 함께 번영할 수 있는 그런 길을 함께 찾고자 했습니다. The Semaul Movement Project began in 2005 in Asia. It is now being operated in 27 villages in nine countries as far as Africa. In a partnership with the UN beginning in 2009, Korean-style millennium villages were constructed in four villages in Tanzania and Uganda. This was the first cooperative project between the United Nations and a local government of Korea. The people who are living in the world are living in the world. They are living in the world. They are living in the world. They are living in the world. Korea's role as a partner of the UN has an even brighter future ahead, thanks to the active participation of its youths. Lee Judy and Chung Hyun are Korean youths deeply interested in the UN's efforts for world peace. They participated in the youth volunteer team created jointly by the UNV and the Korean Ministry of Foreign Affairs. 
the country that I was deployed is Democratic Republic of Congo, so-called DRC. So it's one of the poorest countries in the world. In Congo, DRC has been suffered from a lot of conflicts and war, and especially sexual violence has been used as a weapons of war. So there are a lot of, lot of cases of sexual violence. So our project was to reduce the prevalence of sexual violence in the eastern part of Congo. They were able to witness firsthand the important role that the UN plays in regions where poverty and conflict create human suffering. Like in 50, 60 years ago, that probably people from other countries who are not even Korean would have come, like would come and work. It's very, um, it's very touching. And I was very proud to be part of that people. So it was a very rewarding experience. They saw traces of Korea's past at the fields where they volunteered. When I first visited Timor, I thought, ooh, how can a country be like this in 2014? But then as I think about it, I thought maybe Korea was like the similar or the same. Their dream is to work for world peace as members of the UN by drawing from the experience of Korean development. I can see that I'm happy with uh, what I did and what I'm going to do. So I see it as a very valuable thing. It's priceless. The hopes and aspirations of Korean youths are creating a bright future for the UN and the international community. And I am sure that the number of those youngsters who want to join the United Nations will increase in due course and more and more young generations of Korea are interested in the works of the United Nations, which I'm glad to say. Security-wise, unfortunately, there's an unfinished business. The war has not ended. Okay, we're still divided. And I hope that the United Nations continues to play a key role in helping the reunification of Korea so that not just southern half, but the entire Korean peninsula will be able to enjoy liberal democracy, uh, freedom, and the universal values such as human rights. Conflicts continue to ravage communities across the world. There are people who suffer for lack of a meal and a glass of clean water. It will continue working for the peace and prosperity of mankind, as it has been for the past seven decades.